good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Sabra, and I'm going to lecture today about uh, St. Augustine, the world, life, and thought of uh, this man, St. Augustine, from the 4th and 5th century. Uh, I understand you have done only Plato so far, uh, so you have been introduced to what we call the classical world, or the thought of the classical world, uh, pre-Christian, uh, pre-Islamic, of course, and it's a world where, of course, uh, uh, philosophy is important. In, in, in Greece, also art and philosophy and literature <clears throat> are important. But now we enter a world in the um, 4th and 5th century which is um, a, d a bit different. It's a world uh, which sometimes is called from the 5th to the 13th century the medieval period or the Middle Ages, and here there is a lot of uh, Christian and Islamic thinking about God. There was God, of course, in Plato and Aristotle as well, but here they continue to think about God and religion becomes much more important. But it's not just God philosophically or rationally, it is God who, according to uh, Christianity and Islam, God who has revealed himself, God who has revealed God's self in history and not just is the conclusion of our rational thinking about him. So we begin with Augustine, a major figure who embodied this transition from the classical world of antiquity to the um, Greek, from the Greek and Roman world to what we call the Abrahamic religious world of Christianity, which inherits and interacts with Greek and Roman culture, Greco-Roman culture, and later, of course, the same is done with Islamic thinkers and philosophers who also came in contact with Greek learning and philosophy. Augustine's world is the period of the Roman Empire in the fourth and the fifth century, known as late antiquity. When Augustine was born in the fourth century, Rome had ruled the ancient world for more than five centuries. Throughout its history, the wealth and the population of the Roman Empire were concentrated on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, as you can see from the map here, on the Asi Asiatic and African, as well as on the European shores. So Asia Minor, or Turkey today, Syria, Egypt, and North Africa were Roman and Rome was heir to the ancient civilizations of those lands. If Rome borrowed her literature and art from Greece, she took much of her religion and many of her agricultural practices and political ideas from Asia and Africa. What Rome borrowed from the south and east, she passed on in Latin forms to the north and the west, to northern Italy, to Spain, to Gaul, which is France, and Britain. So England and Egypt, Spain and Syria, France and Turkey were united politically and culturally. But in the fourth and the fifth centuries, there begins the period of decline and disintegration of the Roman Empire. There are many reasons for this decline and decay, but foremost among them were the ever-increasing invasions of the northern barbarian tribes of southern, their invasion of southern Europe, and the fact that the seat of the empire had shifted from the west to the east, from Rome to Constantinople, today Istanbul. So the fourth century was also significant for the history of the Roman Empire from another perspective. It is the century that witnessed the beginning of the Christianization of the empire. In the year 312, one of its emperors, the very Constantine, after whom Constantinople was named, converted to Christianity. The new religion, which had been spreading widely in many eastern and western regions of the empire, finally reached the top ruling class. It began to be recognized as a legitimate religion, not to be persecuted anymore, and later in the fourth century was imposed actually as the only lawful religion in the state. 
Some people who did not convert to Christianity, of course, some thinkers, attributed the fall of Rome in the early years of the fifth century to the fall to the barbarians as a consequence of Rome having abandoned its old religion, its gods, in favor of the new religion, Christianity. This is an accusation which Augustine set out to argue against, to rebut, in a monumental work called The City of God. In education, the fourth century reflects a widening gap between Greek and Latin learning. In the earlier and more prosperous centuries of the Roman Empire, all educated people knew Greek, as well as Latin, of course. Growing localism, however, led to a neglect of Greek and to less frequent contacts between the two cultures. Greek literature had always been more creative. Greek philosophy was unmatched in any other part of the ancient world. The Greeks had an important scientific tradition. In the West, the emphasis was more on poetry and rhetoric. There hardly was any philosophy or science. As for the religious scene of the fourth century, it was definitely multi-religious. There was significant interest in religion and spiritual philosophies, so to speak. There was first Stoicism, which taught that human happiness and dignity result from voluntary obedience to the universal law. Through self-control and love of justice and love of truth, human beings could lead a good life. It was a highly ethical school of thought. Nothing can be good for a man, writes Marcus Aurelius, one of the great Stoic writers in the second century. Nothing can be good for a man unless it helps him, it helps to make him just, self-disciplined, courageous, and independent, and nothing bad unless it has the contrary effect. Uncontrollable external circumstances should be disregarded. Political and social distinctions were unimportant. All human beings had equal rights under the law, the eternal law. Stoicism was very influential in some very high circles in Roman society. It represented, if you like, the rationalist direction in thought and conduct, but it could not appeal to all people. It was too impersonal, too intellectual, too cerebral, too non-effective, affective, non-emotional, indeed anti-affective. But there were also mystery religions, and these were popular among the common people. For example, Mithraism was quite well known. It involved communion with the divinity and the idea of a redeemer, a savior. Mithras was supposedly a Persian and Indian sun god, and Mithraism was the cult of Mithras. It was made an imperial cult in Rome by the emperor Commandus, 180 to 192, all creatures were supposed to have sprung from the bull which Mithras slew before ascending into heaven. Initiation into its mysteries guaranteed a member immortality and blessedness. And Mithraism had similar rights to the Christian rites of baptism and the Eucharist. Another important religious philosophy was Manichaeism. This had a direct influence on Augustine. Manichaeism, named after Mani, a religious figure who was born near modern-day Baghdad, the capital of the Persian Empire at the time. He began his teaching in 240 AD, but the official Zoroastrian religion fought him and got him exiled to India. He later returned to the capital, where he was first accepted, then rejected and killed, and his disciples were banished. His teaching was a mixture of Oriental, Persian ideas with some Christian teachings, especially Mani's own interpretation of the Christian apostle, St. Paul. Mani's teaching was based on a supposed primeval conflict between light and darkness. It taught that the goal of the practice of religion was to release the particles of light which Satan had stolen from the world of light and imprisoned in the human brain, and that Jesus, Buddha, the prophets, and Mani had been sent to help in this task. For the Manichaean believer, 
the whole physical universe was mobilized to create this release. It was a grand myth of salvation on a cosmic level and a very detailed one too, and it claimed to be rational and scientific. To achieve this release, severe asceticism, including vegetarianism, was practiced. Manichaeism was a poetic expression of revulsion, disgust from the material world. Sex and the powers of darkness were intimately related. There was a hierarchy in the sect. There were the elect, the chosen ones, and the hearers. It was a sect that spread rapidly, and it had bishops, like Christianity. It rejected the Old Testament, which is the first part of the Bible, and accepted only selected parts of the New Testament. It was a dualistic interpretation of reality. And then there was Christianity. The most central and formative factor in Augustine's life and thought, so I spend a little more time on it. Christianity was a religion that was widely spreading in the third, third and the fourth centuries. Christianity taught that God was one, radically new with Christianity, but not invented by it, of course. Judaism already had it, and then, of course, Islam had it. Radically new is the idea of God as creator, which meant a sharp distinction, a sharp separation between God and the world. God is not in any sense a continuation of anything in the world. God is radically and wholly other. Now, Greek and Roman thought, as well as Oriental thought, had no such notion. The implication of the doctrine of creation in Christianity is that the world, nature, is in no sense divine or to be deified. Creation is out of nothing. Also very characteristic is that God is not just creator out of nothing, but that God recreates, recreates radically. And this is called redemption or salvation. God is a redeemer, savior. So also, also, although absolutely different from the world, God is very related to the world, very concerned with it to the point of becoming human for the sake of saving the world. Essentially, however, Christianity is not about beliefs or principles or concepts. It's not even a moral code, nor essentially a way of worship or rites and rituals and practices. Essentially, Christianity is about a person, Jesus, called the Christ, an actual historical person who lived, spoke, and taught, and behaved in a certain way, was killed, and his followers claimed that he rose again from the dead and remained with them in the spirit. Christianity is about Jesus of Nazareth, a Jew, who inherited all the religious heritage of the Jews and the Hebrew people, namely belief in a creator God, belief in uh, the prophets Abraham, Moses, and the whole biblical history of the Israelites. This man proclaimed a message. He called people to repentance, a tawbi, and a return to God in preparation for the kingdom or reign or rule of God, which he said was already present. He linked the coming of this kingdom to his own person, to his own work of proclamation. And he had good news to all, especially to those who had despaired of their right to earn God's favor. Those who were viewed by the religious authorities as unworthy or too unclean to be accepted by God. In other words, the sinners, the unclean, the sick, the possessed, the prostitutes, the poor, the transgressors of God's law, even the collaborators with the Roman occupiers, namely all the marginalized, including non-Jews. Jesus basically told people that God is a loving father who accepts all, provided they accept his love and turn to him. His harshest, strongest words were to religious people who were self-righteous, hypocrites, excluders of others, judgmental people who thought that they were better than others because they kept their religious duties, because they fasted, because they obeyed every ritual precept. And so 
thought that they deserved and earned God's reward. He also had very harsh words for the rich. You cannot worship God and money, he said. You have to choose between God and money. His kindest, most compassionate words were to sinners who were humble and ashamed of who and what they were. Now, this Jesus, who was like this and taught these things, was rejected as a conspiracy of politicians and religious authorities. He was arrested, tortured, put to death by crucifixion. His followers claimed that God raised him from the dead. So they understood that as God having confirmed him, vindicated him, and vindicated his message. So a movement started around him, seeing in his suffering and death not the victory of politicians and religious authorities, but a divine act of salvation. God, they believed, was acting through and in Jesus to save humanity. So his life and death were seen as redemptive, salvific. Human sin was seen as taken upon him and was crucified with him, and so he was proclaimed as the savior sent by God. In fact, he was proclaimed as God revealing himself in him in a unique way and acting in him to rescue the world. His followers gathered together to proclaim this good news. Thus came into being the church, the gathering of believers and followers of Jesus who wanted to live this new life together and spread the good news to others. And they preserved the memory of Jesus, his deeds and his sayings and the earliest community's experience of him in what came to be known as the New Testament. Now the Christians believed in one God, of course, but their, their experience with Jesus, in whom they claimed they saw God himself acting and revealing himself, their experience convinced them that God's oneness is not static, is not a static, lifeless, mathematical oneness. God is one, but his unity is dynamic. God is not so much one as one of a kind, but God is God in three ways of being one and the same God. As God over and above us, the creator, the father, as God who is with us and for us, the redeemer, the son, and as God in and among us, the sanctifier or the Holy Spirit. This is the meaning of the Christian affirmation that God is a trinity, not three, but triune, triunity. This is important because Augustine talks a lot about the divine trinity in the confessions, but he also devoted a whole work to that entitled On the Trinity. Now, this Christianity started spreading in the Roman Empire as of the first century, first among the Jews and in Jewish communities in the cities of the empire, but then more and more among non-Jews, the Gentiles as they were called. Now the Greeks and the Romans had a sophisticated culture and philosophy, as you probably saw from Plato. So the new Christian faith, faith had to address them in an appropriate manner. How to present this biblical, Semitic Christian faith to Greco-Roman civilization? Here come in great and creative figures like Augustine who provide a model for the encounter of the Christian faith with the classical culture of antiquity. Now, usually students are thrown into the confessions without having anything, knowing anything about the basic outlines of Augustine's story. I have provided uh, basic facts under number three in your fly sheet something about the life of Augustine, the main uh, stations of his life, and I won't read these. You can look at them later. But I move to number four. Why is Augustine important? Augustine was to become one of the most important Christian thinkers in the West. He combined the classical tradition with the new Christian faith, which was just beginning to be accepted by the Roman Empire. In order for us to understand why Augustine has been such a towering figure in Western civilization, in other words, why he is so important, we need to know something about the formative components of his thought 
and also something about his legacy, what he left us. So the four formative influences of Augustine's thought. As I said, the significance of Augustine is great. It's no doubt due uh, to, in great part to the fact that in him, in his life experience and in his thought are combined the greatest civilizations and cultural components of his day, the Roman, the Persian, the Greek, and the Semitic or Judeo-Christian. I will say just a few words about each, linking them to Augustine's development. First, Cicero, or the Roman component. Augustine's education was basically a typical Roman education. The poet Virgil, he knew almost by heart. The most important influence in his early youth, however, came from reading the dialogues of the Roman and Latin thinker and politician Cicero, the master of prose and poetry in the, Latin, in the Roman world. In fact, he is the creator of classical uh, Latin prose and the father of Latin rhetoric. In the course of one's education, one began with Cicero's rhetorical treatises and speech, speeches and ended with Cicero's philosophical dialogues. So Augustine, after a while, read Cicero's dialogue called the Hortensius in his 19th year. It's a dialogue defending the necessity of philosophical thinking for any critical judgment, even for someone engaged in public political life. This was his first confrontation with philosophy. It raised the question in Augustine's life, how do I attain happiness? For Cicero, happiness is not in self-indulgence in a life of pleasure. Food, drink, and sex are distracting for the mind in pursuit of higher things. The effect of the Hortensius on Augustine was to make him think seriously about ethical and religious issues. Cicero's questions roused the young Augustine and moved him to question the meaning of life. Now, Augustine was not a glutton or a heavy drinker, though he enjoyed eating and it was a bit of a temptation for him as he recounts later in the Confessions. But his real problem, his real problem was his strong sexual desire. At age 17 or 18, when he was in Carthage, Carthage, he had a girlfriend who shared his bed. They lived together for many years. She was a bit slightly low class, but it was a steady relationship after numerous adventures that he had had before. He lived with her for over 13 years, entirely faithfully, and she bore him a son, who apparently was a very intelligent and sharp boy, but did not live long. But Augustine never married her. She was there to satisfy his sexual desires. Augustine's mother was a devout uh, Christian. Her, na her name was Monica. His father was a pagan. He was not a Christian, but he was baptized on his deathbed. And his mother used to take him to church when he was a child and a boy. But Augustine says in the Confessions, he was more interested in the girls in the church than in Christianity. The myths of the Old Testament, Adam and Eve, the dubious morality of some of the stories of the Old Testament did not impress him. So he looked elsewhere for help and satisfaction. He looked to astrology and to an occult theosophy as taught by Mani, whom we already mentioned. So the second component is Mani or the Persian Oriental component. He was associated with this sect for about 10 years. He never managed to become one of the elect. Eventually, he became disillusioned, especially after hearing one of their bishops lecture. Their theories did not stand up to critical rational judgment and were not support, supported by scientific truths. But he was influenced in, by them in lasting ways. His mystical terminology shows resemblance with, his lang with their language. Their high regard for Paul's letters must have also been responsible for Augustine's deep acquaintance with Paul. Some say that the later conception of the two cities city of man and the city of God had Manichaean roots, 
And certainly his preoccupation with sin and evil do have some Manichaean traces. The Greek philosoph philosophical component or Plato. Plato and Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism is a kind of an update of the philosophy of Plato. In 384, Augustine went to Milan in Italy to teach rhetoric. There he met Bishop Ambrose. Through Ambrose, he first got to know the Neoplatonism of Plotinus and Porphyry. And this helped him with the question of conceiving spiritual substances and the problem of evil. Platonism liberated him from the view that God had to be a subtle, refined, luminous matter. He came to understand the concept of spiritual as non-material from Plato. He also came to discover that evil is not a substance, and it is not primeval, as the Manichees had taught. He began to see that Neoplatonism was but a small step from Christianity. Finally, the Christian biblical Semitic component. In, in Milan, as we saw, Augustine makes the, the acquaintance of Bishop Ambrose, who is the bishop of that city. And Ambrose helped Augustine to understand the Christian conception of God through the idea that God is not to be conceived bodily and materially. And Ambrose showed him how evil, evil, a constant concern for Augustine, was reducible to the free will of the human being as its origin rather than to the Manichaean view of a substantial principle of evil in the universe. So Amber's sermons reveal that the Christian faith is not unreasonable. In addition, under the influence of Ambrose, he now starts to read the Bible in a new way, going for the deeper spiritual meaning of texts rather than the outward literal meaning. The high point of this Christian biblical component is Augustine's conversion in Milan in 386, the dramatic account of which is found in book eight. It's called The Garden Experience. And he reads here the end of Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 13, which is really an ethical anti-lust text. Besides, he, he read this in the garden, that's the moment when uh, the straw broke the camel's back, in a sense. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. So the final con uh, conversion of Augustine is a transformation of his will, not simply a conviction of the mind. And this is where the biblical Semitic component comes in very strongly and goes beyond the worldview of much of classical thought and religion. The Stoic philosopher Marcus Aurelius had taught two centuries ago, earlier, that reason never leads you astray. Reason never leads you astray intentionally. Remember the doctrine, he said, that all rational beings are created for one another, that toleration is part of justice, and that men are not intentional evildoers. The Stoics believed that a human being could free himself, herself, of wickedness as soon as he, she chooses. But Augustine's experiences and conviction were different. The basic problem of the human being is the will, not the mind. Conversion is a change of will, and that could only happen by divine grace, not by human achievement. Augustine's conversion, however, was not only of the will, but also of the mind and the whole manner of understanding reality. Now, the principle for understanding reality was called the logos, the word or reason, capital W, which is a concept that Christianity probably borrowed from Stoicism, but it now identified the logos with Christ. The word of God, who is God himself, is now the principle for understanding reality. And this word of God is deposited in the Bible. 
It is the word of a living personal reality, one who cares, provides, is all powerful, not an impersonal power of fate, necessity, fortune, or destiny. Everything, says Augustine, must be referred to divine providence. This was a natural consequence of the idea of God as creator of the world from nothing, and not simply the designer of the world who works with pre-given material. Creation out of nothing, which comes in with Christianity and is also a central doctrine in Islam, is a major break with classical antiquity concerning the absolute dependence of the creature on the creator, the radical otherness of God, and the contingency of the world in contrast to the necessity of God alone. To combine all these streams and influences of the most important civilizational components in one man was the mark of Augustine, the Roman, the Persian, the Greek, the Semitic Christian. His greatness is precisely that he participated vigorously in the main human civilizations that made up the ancient world. And he was able to express that participation in an effective manner through his writings. Through his writings. In him, we would say today, in him there was a dialogue of the most important civilizations and cultures. What I've said so far about the components of Augustine's thought tells us about what went into the formation of his thought, but his legacy is about what came out of the combination of these elements, what he left for us for posterity, what effects he had. And I shall briefly mention six points only. Faith and reason is the first one. Theology and philosophy in the Middle Ages and in the rising universities in the 12th and the 13th centuries are rooted in Augustine's view, views on faith and reason. You could not discuss the relationship of faith and reason, philosophy and revelation in the Middle Ages and beyond without bringing in Augustine. For example, later on Thomas Aquinas or Dante and so on. Un can't understand them without Augustine. Two, Western Christian mysticism was heavily influenced by Augustine, especially the centrality of love in his thinking and uh, the centrality of the idea that happiness implies self-renunciation. Augustine stressed the heart and feelings, especially in writings like the Confessions, but also in his thought in general. Yet, unlike the Romantic movement of the 18th century, which came later and also stressed the heart and feelings, but it did so against reason or the intellect. Unlike them, he was the founder of the heart language in the West without being anti-intellectual or irrational. Three, both Catholicism and Protestantism, the two major forms of Christianity in the West and worldwide, claim him as their theological teacher and father. The Catholics especially stress his views on the freedom of the will, merit, and the authority of the church. The Protestants stress the centrality of grace. Martin Luther is not possible or comprehensible without Augustine. Four, the doctrine of original sin goes back to him. Original sin is that idea that human beings are, as one put it, one theologian put it, human beings are held down by a dead weight of personal and collective egotism. This has shaped Western Christian consciousness even way after many people in the West abandoned Christianity. The modern period in the Enlightenment was against this seemingly pessimistic view of human nature. But in the contemporary period, the doctrine has gained relevance again after the horrendous evils of the 20th century and the first two decades of the 21st. Five, Augustine reconciled much of Plato and Christianity, also Christianity and Neoplatonism, though he did not simply accept Platonism and Neoplatonism uncritically. What Thomas Aquinas later did by reconciling Christianity with Aristotle, Augustine had earlier done for Christianity and Platonism. Six, finally, Augustine's psychological analyses, some say anticipated some of Freud's work. He was perhaps the first to discover the existence of the subconscious. This is especially evident in the Confessions. Here he expresses in a dramatic fashion 
that task not only for self-revelation, but also for self-explication, which has led to the development of modern psychology and psychiatry. He is not just an autobiograph in the Confessions. He is, in the widest sense, a psychoanalyst, asking questions like, why are babies jealous? Why did he dislike the study of Greek as a schoolboy? Why are we happier? Why are we happier in finding something lost than we would be if we never lost it at all? How is it possible, simultaneously, at the same time, to will and not to will the same thing? Now, about the book, The Confessions. It was written during his first three years as a bishop. Confession is a word that carries the meaning of both praise and penitence. These are confessions of sins, but they are also praise, tasbih, and faith, a manifesto of the inner world of the soul and its experiences. The Confessions is not an autobiography, is an autobiography of the heart. Its emotional tone is striking. The serious reader cannot miss its sincerity. It is striking whether you agree with him or not. But it's not all emotions. There is rational discourse. There is critical thinking also there. It's an exceedingly personal book, but it is also one with which people can identify. In the Confessions, we enter the world of a very sensitive man, as one historian put it. We enter the world of a very sensitive man, an extremely inward man, but surprisingly, a man not alone. There have always been friends around him, for these are not the confessions of a hermit. He wrote the confessions as a dialogue between him and God. Historians of classical antiquity and early Christianity have noted that in more than a thousand years of literary history, the Greco-Roman world had failed to produce anything which might be justly called a personal record. In this sense, Augustine was perhaps anticipated only by the emperor Marcus Aurelius, whom we've already mentioned, the Stoic, who wrote the Meditations. But the differences between the Confessions and the Meditations are not less remarkable than the resemblances between them. The main difference between them is the fact that while the work of Augustine was addressed to God, that of Marcus Aurelius was addressed to himself. Marcus Aurelius in his meditations is concerned never to expose a weakness, remembering that it is his business to exemplify so far as possible the conventional type of excellence enshrined in the heroic ideal. Augustine, on the other hand, is content to defy every canon of classicism in order merely to bear witness to the truth. So Marcus produces a textbook of virtue, while Augustine achieves a record so fresh and vivid as to have moved the philosopher William James to describe him as the first modern man. He draws the picture of a concrete human being in whose presence the barriers of time and space drop away to reveal him as one in all respects like us, a unique human person, but clothed with the common graces and disgraces of humankind. The Confessions set a wholly new standard in autobiography. Yes, he was the first to write a real autobiography, an honest and not a beautified representation of his own life. And what does he discover about the human life that he writes about? At first, not more than this. Something is not right with the human being. Precisely in his remembrance of the wild experiences of his youth, Augustine sees that something is not right about the human being. We live in perversion. At the same time, we want and yearn to get out of it. It is unbearable to stay in it. It leads us and produces in us anxiety and restlessness. Finally, about the structure of the book, books one to nine are a form of autobiography until his mother's death. And 10 to 13, they concern his being bishop and explainer or expositor of the Bible. 
and there's a Neoplatonic analysis of memory, time, creation, and an exegesis of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 1. The autobiographical sections illustrate a thesis restated in more theological dress by the last four books. The rational creature, the human being, has turned away from God by neglect, preferring external things and the illusion that happiness consists in bodily satisfaction. Therefore, the soul falls below its own level and disintegrates. But at the deepest abyss of the ego, the soul longs for reintegration and completeness. This is realized in the love of God and the example and expiation of Christ as the mediator and proclaimer of that love. In that sentence, in the first chapter in the first book, lies the meaning of the whole work and the whole of human life as Augustine understood it. God has made human beings for himself, and human hearts shall find no rest until they find the rest in him. <laughs>